Okay, is it all three? Let me send one more time for those just freshly joined. Um, you could download the material either through the QR code or the link that I just sent on the uh, chat. Um, it has the material that we're going to be using today. Um, yep. Okay, so welcome everyone to the Overmark Tech 3 Pure Bio end of year revision. I know a lot of you, your end of year is probably coming up within the next two weeks, right? So um, thanks for taking time to join this revision. It's going to be a it's going to be a chill revision. It's not meant to target like every single thing um, in your syllabus. Impossible, right? Unless I have like 10 hours. Um, I will target like the most important. I picked the three chapters that I think it is um, the most recent probably, like um, the most recent chapters and perhaps could be slightly more challenging uh, from my experience with my students, um, which is transport in human respiration and excretion and it's also because they are kind of related to each other which I'll highlight how so today the agenda is to um we'll go through the revision kit which is the one that um I sent on the chat for you guys to download and um we'll go through some exam tips uh then we'll have Q&A and then uh Kahoot quiz like do stay through uh the end because we'll have a Kahoot quiz which the winner, of course, we only have one winner and the winner will get the curated notes for bio. If you want to win the curated notes, you can stay on uh, or you can, or, or you just want to uh, stay on for bragging rights, right? Uh, code is always competitive. Um, but before we start, can I, um, there is, there's, I, know, I know that we can use the Zoom chat as a way to collect questions, but it's very hard for me to track because there's a lot of people on the Zoom chat so can i get you guys to log into this website slido.com um you can it's you can use your phone you can use your like laptop if you're using laptop or ipad go into slido.com and you can insert this tag hash 228-0025 i'll send on the chat as well um this is where you can ask you can send a question in Maybe I will demonstrate how this is done. And it's, it's very helpful. Um, why is it? 228. So after you join this, you could type your question. Um, and it will help me to track questions better. Um, for past sessions, every time when there's like the questions on Zoom chat, it gets like pushed out very easily. And uh, no, I cannot go through homeostasis because this is not part of my today syllabus yeah um and so this is very easier for me to track and i can uh look through each question at the end okay so um if you have any question at any point of time you just type it in like it because uh, then i can look back uh i have used this for my crash course and it has helped a lot so um yeah we'll, we'll make use of this and i'll be tracking this as well okay I will send the link again. Okay, because people will be joining. Um, if join the then just no choice. Huh? Okay, right. Too bad. Okay. Yeah, so let's start with the revision kit. So you guys should have downloaded this. Um, the topics that we'll be covering is these three topics. All right. Um, okay, so let's start. Uh, but before that, <laughs> introduce myself. My name is Ping Wei. Um, I am Overmark Pure Bio Tutor. Um, this year, I, I, I kind of covered both Combine and Pure, but moving forward, I'll be focusing on Pure Bio only. Um, I'm from Raffles. I was from Raffles. Then I went on to NUS to read Life Science and Psychology. So if you are interested in like Life Science or Psychology, uh, you can ask me as well. I have seven years of teaching experience. I started teaching since I completed my A-level. And I had had uh I have had like many students. This is like a rough gauge. I didn't really like count it. But yeah, that that um I think I used to say that when I was like when I first started teaching, I used to say that, oh, I am I I'm a student as well. So I would know the struggle of students the best, so I can teach the best. But now it has been like really long since I was a student, like a student that needs to take national exam. But I think um 
over the years of teaching students, the pattern's still there. So uh, I think that helps. Yeah. Um, um, the front part is all about over. It's more like introduction about Overmark. I don't know how familiar you guys are with Overmark, but um, since our last year, it was how when last year was our first year, and this year being second year, we have expanded a lot, uh, a lot of subjects. And I know you guys are sec three, but moving on in the future, even if you all go on to sec four and then A level, there's also A level subjects available. And um, for Next year, if you guys, I mean, now you are tech three already, so you guys more or less know how, how well you are on track for O level, right? And if you need extra help for, um, tuition, so uh, Overmark provides, uh, like this whole suite of subject that um I believe will be helpful if you need any extra help, um, beyond what your school offers. Yeah. So take a look at all this. I mean, it's part of it. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about this, but let's start with our bio revision. Um okay. Okay, wait, my okay. The first part I'm gonna talk about blood vessels. Um for the blood vessels, it's a generic name for everything that carries blood. And there's three kinds of blood vessels: artery, capillaries, and veins. And they are very different and they have different features. In this case, what do you need to know about artery, veins, and capillaries? So the first part is the function, right? What, what makes something artery, what makes something veins, what makes something capillaries? So the function of artery is transport blood away from the heart. So the easy way to remember is artery away. So anything that transport blood away from the heart is considered an artery. It doesn't matter whether or not it's oxygenated, it is like deoxygenated, does it have glucose? We don't care. It is the direction of the blood, right? As long as it's transporting blood away from the heart, it's considered an artery. And if it's transport blood back to the heart, it's a vein. Um, and the structure, because of the function, therefore the structure will be different. Remember for bio, it's always the structure supporting the function, right? You always heard like, oh, how is lung adapted to its function? How is small, adapt small intestine adapted to its function? Things like that. Um, so... For artery, because it transports blood away from the heart, it needs to be able to withstand the pressure. So the structure is that it's thick, muscular, and elastic wall. Uh, there's no semi-lunar valve. There is a smaller lumen. So in contrary, you know, like as, as how differences work, it's the opposite for vein. It's not as thick, not as muscular, and not as elastic. It is still kind of thick, muscular, and elastic. It's not that it's completely not thick. That, that as you can see from this, there is still some smooth muscle, elastic muscle. There is still certain thickness, right? It's just, as compared to artery, it's not so much. And then there's valve present as well. You can see that this is the valves and there's a larger lumen. So these are the three differences between artery and veins. So if any question asks you to describe the difference between artery and veins, these are your three points. And you need to know all three points, right? One thing about bio is that it's not about just like, Oh, one, uh, one difference. Okay, as long as I know one difference, can ready. If there are three differences, three differences for you to know, you need to know all three because maybe the question is three marks. Maybe the question show you a diagram and they're asking for a very specific difference. Then you need to be able to uh list that out. Okay, so there are three difference, three differences in structure between artery and vein. Um, so why are they different? How does the structure support its function? Artery wall, as we mentioned just now, it needs to carry blood away from the heart. And our heart is the pump. When it contracts, it pushes blood that has very, very high blood pressure. If y'all see the chat, have anyone asking for um uh, anyone asking for the link, right? Just help me send because I'm very distracted if I see the chat keep moving. So I'm gonna close the chat. Okay. So please help me if anyone as for the link. Those who are already in, you all will see the history, right? Yeah, you all help me send, okay? Um, Because if the chat keep moving, I my side, I keep looking at that. Okay, so because of that, the blood pressure in the artery are very high. Therefore, the arteries wall need to be able to withstand the pressure. Imagine an artery wall that cannot withstand the high pressure. It will just snap. That's very scary, right? So therefore, the artery wall and thick and muscular to withstand the immense pressure. 
right? So they are a pair of keywords together. You cannot say it's thick and muscular without saying that that is to withstand the high blood pressure. Arteries are also elastic, so they are able to stretch and recoil. So think of your rubber band. You can stretch it out, and then when you let go, it will recoil back. So same for arteries. When blood flows through there, the high pressure, it will stretch out. But when blood leaves the part, it will recoil back to its original shape, original width. So it's also important. If it's not elastic, it's not able to stretch, it recoil back then the artery, once the blood pressure passes through, it will be very large. So elastic, therefore able to stretch and recoil. So um, that is, okay, the first thing. Um, a lot of students will say, actually, I know, I think I have the keywords, but why I cannot get a score, right? That's one thing is that keywords are never come like, keywords never come individually. Keywords always come in like a set. So thick and muscular must always match with withstanding the immense pressure for the artery case. Uh, elastic pet match with able to stretch and recoil. Then that is one full set of keywords. Okay. And then for veins, uh, yeah, because the blood pressure is not so high, right? Um, and in fact, the blood pressure in the veins are very low. That's why we need valve. Therefore, there's no need for the uh, wall of veins to be thick, muscular, or elastic. Uh, it does not need to serve that function. And then for valves, um, it's there to prevent the backflow of blood. Valve will, valve will come out quite a bit, uh, even in the heart, in the veins and everything. Even in some arteries, it will be present, right? There are two arteries where valve is present. Even though tradition, typically we always say valves are only present in veins, but there are two arteries with valve, right? So if you, if you are like, huh, there are two arteries with valve, then, then you need to know your content better. So valve is present in, in general to prevent the backflow of blood. So I write here that valve will prevent the backflow of blood, right? But is this all the keywords that are needed when you are answering questions? Depends. So if you're talking about veins, that's fine. Valve will close to prevent the backflow of blood. But if you're talking about other valve, for example, those in heart, we need to mention that it prevents backflow of blood from where to where, right? Because prevent backflow of blood, that's too generic. We, we need to be specific from where to where. Lastly, there's, lastly, there's a large lumen, larger lumen than uh, artery to offer lower resistance to blood flow. The blood pressure is really very low, so we need to give it as much uh, space to flow as possible. Okay, so um, that that is the set of keywords for the adaptation to function. The blood pressure is high in artery, low in, uh, low in veins, and then Speed of blood flow, of course, um, if blood pressure is high, of course, the blood flow is fast. If the blood pressure is low, it also makes sense for the blood flow to be slow. So that is artery and veins. This, what is in between it, is also really important, um, is the capillaries. So for capillaries, the function, this is really important. I think, I think students definitely know that the function is, the, the exact function is to exchange substances. So it depends on where these capillaries are at. If these capillaries are your lung capillaries, what do they exchange? They mainly exchange gases, right? Oxygen and um, carbon dioxide. And then if these capillaries are at your D line, what are the main things that are being exchanged? Nutrients, glucose, amino acid, um, and potentially waste material. If it's if it's muscle cell, capillaries in your leg muscle, hand muscle, when you're exercising, then it is exchanging glucose, carbon dioxide, oxygen, urea. In general, any substances that are that the cells need or the cells need to remove, that happens at capillaries. The structure, uh, the structure of capillaries, the wall of capillary is one cell thick. The wall of capillary. This is really important because it's very easy under like stressful condition or in like, oh, you want to write faster, uh, your first reaction is that one cell thick. So you just write capillary is one cell thick. But capillary is not one cell thick. It's the wall of capillary that's one cell thick, right? And this applies to a lot of other things that is about the wall. So uh, remember to write that. And it has a very, very narrow lumen. It is so narrow that for blood capillaries, only like the red blood cells have to line up to pass through. So that's how small it is, the lumen. 
Okay. And how does the structure support the function? Being one cell thick wall offers a shorter diffusion distance. So therefore, the exchange of material is faster. That's really important. Imagine it's like one cell thick is like walking 10 meter and two cell thick is walking 20 meter. So of course, you want to walk 10 meter, right? So that's faster. So faster exchange of substances. And there is an extensive network of blood capillaries. Um, it is, okay, we want to distinguish extensive network of capillaries and an extensive branching. When we say extensive network of capillaries, um, it is, there are a lot, a lot of capillaries surrounding the villi, surrounding the small intestine, surrounding the lung. So that makes sure that there's continuous flow of blood maintaining the steep concentration gradient. Okay, and that ensure, and we learn in exchange, a transport in material that a steep concentration gradient also means a fast exchange of material, right? Sliding down a slide that is very steep and very gentle, the steep one definitely you will reach the bottom faster. So that helps to make sure that the exchange of material is also fast. And then for the extensive branching, it is shown here. You can see that the artery and arterial is just one single tube, but when it reaches the capillary, it starts branching out. That is extensive branching. Can uh, seen like uh, shown like that. How does the extensive branching helps? It increases the total cross-sectional area of the vessel. What does total cross-sectional area mean? So when artery is like that, okay, let's say artery is like that. This is the surface, this is the cross-sectional area. It means you cut it, this area, that is the cross-sectional area. But for branching cases like this, the cross-sectional area is, if you put it like that, everything that passes through the blood capillaries, you add it up. So even though it's very narrow, because of the extensive branching, the surface area is actually, the cross-sectional area is actually larger than a single tube. Because of that, the blood flows, it lowers the blood pressure, it also slows down the blood flow. And that is very good because if imagine if it flows through the lung or flows through the small intestine really quick, then there's no time for diffusion, no time for active transport for the exchange of substances. So we need like full time to make sure our blood is oxygenated at the lung, right? So we need all the time that the lung can get to... Uh, get all the oxygen in and remove all the carbon dioxide. So this extensive branching increase cross-sectional area and then lower the blood pressure, slow down blood flow. Okay, and therefore the blood pressure of course in capillary is very low and the speed of blood flow is very slow as well. Okay, so that is the differences between this um, artery and vein. And they're really important for the whole transport. You'll be using them a lot. Um, in uh, a lot of questions that involve artery and veins or even other questions. Um, so, so knowing this, the blood pressure and speed of blood flow, a fun fact is that imagine like all the blood that's flowing through your body right now, at any given moment, where do you think will be most blood, most of the blood will be found? So actually, most of the blood will be found in the veins. Supposedly, you think that veins and arteries should be quite even. But because the blood flow in vein much slower, so most of the blood will be found in vein and then um, arteries. And the least amount of blood will be found in capillaries. Just because capillaries cannot even uh, carry so much blood. Capillaries are very tiny, so not a lot of blood can be there. Yeah. Okay, so this is the difference. Um, the typical question from artery, veins, and capillaries Mainly, they like to compare artery and veins. So they give you a picture and ask you to identify uh, artery, veins, and capillary. So look out for the features that we just fell out. Uh, it will determine like whether or not it's artery, capillaries, or veins. Um, another kind they like to ask that I prepared a question here is this kind. It's slightly more complicated. It it kind of targets the uh it targets the relationship between artery, arterioles, capillaries, venue, and veins. So one thing here is that you must always remember that the blood flows in that direction. From heart to artery, and then to arterioles, then to capillaries, and then to venue, and then to veins. Okay, so that is the flow of blood. So let's 
I'm going to give you guys like one, two minutes to just try this question and I'll go through. Okay, so for this question, they kind of plot three graph and it means different thing, right? For for the sake of the like colors, I'm gonna um I'm gonna label them because it's not very actually it's very hard. So this is Y, um this is X, and the dotted one is Z. Okay. So here, uh, how do you start? Just try to find which one, which one do you most co confident of? Okay, um, for pressure of blood, it's actually very straightforward. For pressure of blood, the artery is definitely the highest. And then it just keeps going down. So probably this part is very obvious, right? Artery is definitely the highest. But the capillaries or veins have a higher blood pressure. So the, the idea is that as the further away it is from the heart, because heart is the source of the pressure, the heart, when the heart contracts, it generates force. So that is the source of pressure. The further away it is from the heart, the lower the blood pressure. So therefore, Z represents the pressure of the blood. So therefore, we have these two. Okay, how about total cross-sectional area? I think this is the part where it confuses my student. But just now, we just mentioned the capillaries, when it branches, it increases the total cross-sectional area, right? So therefore, the peak, of the cross-sectional area would be at capillaries. So therefore, the X curve is cross-sectional area. Okay, so the answer is obvious now, but let's uh, talk about the last one, velocity of blood flow. Velocity is basically speed, right? Kind of, don't pick me up, don't pick on me about um, physics, but velocity is about basically about speed, right? Um, so therefore, the blood, um, the question, I get the most is that, okay, so why do veins have such a high speed? Supposedly, okay, it's not really speed. It is at the rate it is moving from one point to another. So um, in this case, artery is definitely the fast one and capillaries is slow. That one we established. But for veins, um, because there is valve, the presence of valve, so actually even though the blood flow, the blood flow is slow, if you measure how fast it moves from one point to another, as long as the veins were, the, the muscle will contract and then it will push up and then the vein will quickly close. So actually, the movement from like one section to another, this is the valve. So there are many, many valves present. So this point, like that, like that, like that, like that, is actually quite fast. Yeah. So why is represents the velocity of blood flow here. Um, oops. Okay, so the answer is C. Okay. Um, okay, if you have any question, because I saw a chat, I just now saw a question, but for those who just joined, uh, can I get you guys to go to this website, fido.com, and insert Two two eight zero zero two five, um, and I will. I see a lot of questions already, so I think I need to. I will spend some time to do Q and A, uh, so I will answer all your questions then. Um, yeah. And to the questions that was already straight to me through the chat, capillaries is not the furthest away from the heart. It's artery, arterioles, capillaries, venous veins. This is the sequence of blood flow, and then from the veins it will go back to heart. All right, let's move on. We have a lot of time. Okay, the structure of the heart. Uh, the structure of the heart is really important to understand cardiac cycle because I know most students struggle with cardiac cycle, right? I don't know if you guys are one of them, but most of my students struggle with cardiac cycle. That's understandable because the, the graph like makes you nervous being like so um, a lot of up and down. Okay, but knowing the structure of heart and knowing the flow of the blood in the heart is really important to understand cardiac cycle be better. So firstly, how do you remember the structure of the heart? My rule is 4441. I think after you know this 4441, uh, you, will, you, you, you will remember the structure of the heart. I wanted to go through like 
uh, drawing or structure of heart, but I think I will move on for the sake of time. First, the four chamber. Which are the four chamber? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't write down, but you can use this to write it down. It's the left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle. That is the four chambers of the heart. And there's four blood vessels that are um, linked to the heart. One that enters the right side and leaves the right side. Another one enters the left side and leaves the left side. So add up to have four blood vessels, right? So vena cava transport blood back to the right atrium. Pulmonary artery leaves the heart, right? Artery transport blood away from the heart. So pulmonary artery. Then pulmonary vein transport blood back to the left atrium. And then aorta transport blood away from the left ventricle in the heart. So there are four blood vessels linked to the heart. So knowing the four chambers, knowing the four blood vessels, and lastly, not lastly, but next, there are four valves that are involved. The four valves are your left and right side. Right, All these are double up because there's left side and right side. Uh, your atrial ventricular valve, as the name suggests, is the valve between atrium and ventricle. Um, the valve on the left side is called bicuspid valve. On the right side, it's called tricuspid valve. And there is also two valves that are the semilunar valve. So these are the special valves, right? Remember, we learned that we, we mentioned that uh, veins have valves, but artery don't. There are two, there are two exceptions. The artery that are linked to the heart have a valve to prevent the backflow of the blood back to the ventricle. So these are the uh, semilunar valve, or you can call it a pulmonary valve for the one in pulmonary artery. And then uh the aortic valve, the one in aorta. So that is the main structure of the heart. And you really need to know this well because without being able to label them, without knowing exactly what is the direction of blood flow of all this, then it is quite difficult to understand our next part. Okay, so oh, of course there's one middle wall. Uh, it's not labeled here, so I'm going to write it down. It's called medium septum. Median septum. What does it do? It separates the right side and left side prevent the mixing of oxygenated blood in the left ventricle and the deoxygenated blood in the right ventricle. Okay, so this is the structure of the heart. Make sure you know them and the flow of the blood, right? Okay, moving on. It's a very common question, I would say. If you go and flip your TYS, there will be some questions that are related to the wall thickness, to the blood pressure. So I kind of want to go through the idea here. Um, you may be familiar with it because if your school tested this topic before, probably it has come out before. It's about, okay, let's say the question. So I have two sample questions here, all right? So let's go through them. The first question is identify, <laughs> identify, identify and explain why the chamber of the heart have different thickness. This is actually a question that I pluck out from TYS. Uh, but mainly it's about the chamber of the heart have different thickness, which they do. Okay, the four chamber of the heart here, left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, and right atrium, they have different thickness. So what is the ranking? Which one is the thickest? Which one to the thinnest? So atrium wall, the right and left, are the thinnest. Why? Because when the wall of atrium contract, the force exerted is smaller and the blood pressure is lower. And that is good enough because blood only needs to be transported from the atrium to the ventricle. So this will be your, this is your cause and effect graph. Thickness of the wall will affect the force exerted, right? If it's very thick and muscular, when it contracts, there's a lot more force than a thin and not so muscular wall. And then when the force exerted is high, the blood pressure is high. And it affects where the blood is being transported to. Okay, so example here, a thicker wall means a higher force exerted when it contracts and therefore higher blood pressure and blood can be transported at a faster rate and to somewhere far within a short period of time. So this is the relationship. The relationship, I love using arrows because I think in bio it's either step one, like either it's different steps or it's different relationship. Like this step one cause step two, cause step three, cause step four. Yeah, so I love using arrows and pictures like that. So in this case, when they ask you, 
why the chamber of the heart have different thickness, they're asking about here. So you need to explain everything after that, right? They're asking about the thickness of the wall. So therefore, you talk about how the force exerted affects the blood pressure and therefore it affects how the blood can be, where, how fast the blood can be transported to, um, how fast and how far the blood can be transported to. So in this case, where do the blood um, in the atrium is being transported to? The ventricle, super near to each other. Blood in atrium, transport to ventricle, right? So therefore, of course, the wall don't have to be thin, the force don't have to be strong, the blood pressure don't have to be high because the blood that's being transported to the next spot is ventricle, really near to each other. But for the ventricle, it's different. The left ventricle needs to transport blood to the rest of the body, which imagine someone that's like two meters tall, like those basketball players. It's really far. It's a very far distance from the heart to like the toe. That is the furthest distance I can think of. So the wall of ventricle needs to be thick and it generates more force and higher blood pressure. Therefore, can be transported to the rest of the body. But for right ventricle, it's different. Uh, right ventricle, of course, is still thicker than the atrium. But in this case, the force exerted don't need to be so high. The blood pressure don't need to be so high because the blood that's being transported from the right ventricle is towards the lung. And your heart and your lung is still nearer to each other compared to your heart and the rest of the body. So in this question, if you don't talk about the force, don't talk about the blood pressure, you only talk about this, it's an incomplete answer. You do have to talk about all three points. Okay? Um, so that is your template. In bio, there's a lot of template for answers. Uh, what do I mean by template is that if the question, they, they may phrase it very differently, but the, um, the keywords are the same. So let's say this next question. Why is the blood pressure in the left ventricle higher than the right ventricle? That is the question, right? Part A and part B kind of asking very similar things, but the question is different. And therefore, the answer will be a bit different as well. Okay, so now the question is asking about blood pressure. Why is it that left ventricle pressure is higher than right ventricle? So when they ask this, should you answer here? Or do you answer here? Which one is the priority? I mean, if you have time and you have number of lines and the points given are high, you can write all, you can write both, right? But what is the priority? The priority should be things in front. Okay, because the blood pressure is not generated by where the blood is being transported to. The blood pressure is generated by the thickness of wall and the force exerted. So left ventricle has a thicker wall than right ventricle. So when the thicker wall contract, more force is exerted, generating a higher blood pressure. That is why the blood pressure in the left ventricle is higher than the right ventricle. Okay, so I think for questions like that, you're going to see it in many different ways, I believe. Um, this is a template to follow. When I say template, it's not the, the, like the answer answer, but the keywords and the direction that you think will follow this for sure. Um, yep, so that is this part. This is like a very common mistake that I see. That's why I feel like I need to talk about this. Um, next part is your favorite, right? This is your favorite, right? Uh, cardiac cycle. Um, I will use the... I need to use my slide to talk about it because I want to draw on my iPad and I can't draw on PDF document. Um, so for this question, for cardiac cycle, what are the things that you need to know? They, they like to test two things. Uh. One is the opening and closing of valve. Which I teach you a hack. It's like once you know the hack, you immediately will always get the valve opening and closing right. That's one. And the second they like to test is the contraction and relaxation, systole and diastole. When do atrium, when do ventricle contract, when do atrium contract, when do they relax? These are the two things that they like to test the most from cardiac cycle. Okay, so before we move on to this uh, question, before we, not question, before we move on to this cardiac cycle, what is, what determines the blood pressure? The y-axis is blood pressure, the x-axis is time. I care a lot about y-axis and x-axis. I think they tells you a lot of things, right? Okay, 
time we, we, do, we don't care why, uh, for x-axis, but y-axis is blood pressure. So what determines the blood pressure? What determines whether or not it goes up or it goes down? Right? Something must decide the blood pressure, right? So the most straightforward one is, of course, when it contract, the blood pressure will go up. That's what we learned here. When you contract, the force exerted will force the blood pressure to go up, right? So therefore, um, when the blood pressure go up, some contraction may have happened. The second thing that um, determines the blood pressure is the volume of blood. It is the, um, if there's a higher volume in the, um, be it atrium, ventricle, or aorta, the blood pressure will also go up. Right, because if there's no blood, then the blood pressure is like low. If there's more blood, then the blood pressure is high. So these are the two things that determines blood pressure. Not that they will test this, but it's just kind of a, a bit more context. In case you ever wonder like, okay, so what determines like it goes up or down? Okay, and then when it's diastole and diastole, and when that's valve open and close. Okay, so I'm going to go straight into this because I want to draw. Okay, let's target the part about diastole and diastole first. So when is diastole and when is diastole? Contraction, just now we already learned, when it contract, the blood pressure will go up, right? So therefore, when does atrium contract and when do ventricle contract, find the point where it goes up. That's as simple as that. So atrium start contracting here and ventricle start contracting here because these are the points where the blood pressure went up. Okay? It's just like that. So, um, even if they give you any like random graph, this is your typical graph actually. Uh, this shape of graph is very common. But if let's say they give you a very weird shape kind of graph, which we know that like schools are capable of like for prelim papers, for your, basically school-based paper, they will give more creative questions. It's not that they are wrong and wild, just that they like to they want to test your fundamental understanding instead of understanding of this particular image. Right, that's fine. But just remember when blood pressure goes up, the point where the blood pressure goes up is where size still happens. So this point for atrium, the blue 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 line, it went up. So this is when left atrium contracted. This left ventricle very obvious also, right? Because it goes up all the way. Okay, and then the next part is diastole which is relaxation uh i think for diastole it's basically any time that is not diastole so this part is left atrium contraction anything after that is left atrium diastole but for ventricle wise um okay let me cut let me talk about the end of the ventricular diastole later uh but the start is obvious okay we established that now let's go on to the valve the um the the when do the valve close and open? Okay, my hack, okay, um uh, is to think of blood pressure and the path of blood. Okay, so um I wrote down in your notes the whole long list of the path of blood, but I'm gonna focus only on left atrium, left ventricle to aorta here. Okay? This one you need to know. Lah. If you don't know, then we don't. We cannot continue un understanding cardiac cycle. All right. So this is the blood flow. All right? So which means that when blood pressure is high in left atrium, it will flow into the left ventricle. And then it will flow into aorta. Make sense? Make sense. Okay. And remember that valve, what is the function of valve? The function of valve is to prevent the backflow of blood to ensure that blood flows in one direction. So which means that valves are present to make sure that blood only flows from atrium to ventricle to aorta, but not other way around. So let's talk like let's look at this bicuspid valve. Okay, let me okay, never mind. Let me take, just ignore these two green green lines. Um okay, so the first thing that you need to remember is that the closing and opening of valve, like the initial open and close part, only happens at the intersection of graph, intersection of curves, intersection of the graphs. Why? Because only at the intersection of graphs, there is a change in blood pressure. Blood pressure. Important. 
Okay, let's say this point. There's a... Okay, no. Annoys me. I need to... Right, again. Okay. LA to LB to Aota. Okay. Okay, at this point, there is a change in blood pressure, right? Before that, the left atrium pressure is higher than the left ventricle. So the left atrium pressure is higher than the left ventricle. Okay, I'm going to draw the first part. Left atrium pressure higher than the left ventricle. So what would, what would that mean? As we generally know, high pressure to low pressure, high potential to low potential, high concentration to low concentration. That is like the natural forces, right? How in general things work. So along this whole line, when the blood pressure in the left atrium is higher than the left ventricle, the blood would flow from the left atrium to the left ventricle. Right? Makes sense. But at this point, something changed. At the intersection, something changed. The blood pressure of the left ventricle become higher than the blood pressure in the left atrium at this intersection point. So this is the second part. The left ventricle pressure become higher than the left atrium. The blood flow, like that, high to low, right? We learned that high to low, natural forces. But is that the blood flow that you want? No, that's not. That's back flow of blood. That's like bad. Right? So that's why the bicuspid valve will close to prevent the backflow of blood. So any time when the valve closes, it's because we want to prevent the backflow of blood. Okay, so let's zoom in to the next point. This one. This is another intersection. So left ventricle contracted. That's why the blood pressure goes up. So the bicuspid valve closes to prevent the backflow of blood. Okay, the blood pressure in the left ventricle keep going up until it is higher than the one in aorta at this point, right? At this intersection. So it is higher than the one in aorta. Naturally, blood pressure will flow from high to low. Is that something we want? Is that the pathway of blood that is desirable? Yes, it is. Therefore, the valve will open to allow the blood to flow through. So therefore, that is when the semilunar valve open up. So you see the pattern? When we don't want the pathway of blood, the natural pathway of blood, we close the valve. If we want, then we open the valve. So now the ventricle contract, contract, contract. Then the blood starts flowing from the left ventricle into the aorta. And then at this point, the blood pressure in the left ventricle starts to reduce. It haven't relaxed yet. It is still contracting, but it starts to reduce because most of the blood has been transported to aorta. And then, so like most of the blood has been transported to aorta, and then at this point, the blood pressure starts dropping because most of the blood is gone already. Remember just now we say, when the blood, there's no blood, there's no blood pressure, right? That's why the blood pressure is going down. So at this point, when it, Intersection, the next intersection again, there's a change in blood pressure. All along, the left ventricle pressure is higher than the aorta. But at this point, the left ventricle pressure falls below the aorta. So let's set a new line. The aorta pressure now is higher than the left ventricle, which means the blood naturally will flow this direction. But that is the backflow of blood. So we will close the semilunar valve to prevent the backflow of blood. And then is drop, drop, drop. The blood pressure now falls below the atrium. So come back. A full cycle where the left atrium pressure is basically higher than the left ventricle pressure, which is this line. Right? And therefore, bicuspid valve open to allow the flow of blood. So that is the full understanding. But if you want to just like quickly, let's say it's MCQ. MCQ question, you don't want to spend, like, you don't want to go through all these things, right? You just want to look at, okay, let's say I ask you what happens here. The MCQ question will ask you what happens here. You just need to give a quick answer. Don't need to go through all the explanation. Just look, which one has got higher pressure there? The red one is above the back one, right? So the left ventricle pressure, left ventricle pressure is higher than the aorta pressure. Then the blood will flow from left ventricle to aorta. 
Then you ask yourself, is this blood flow what we want? Yes. Then we open the valve. If this blood flow is not what we want, then we close the valve. Of course, provided that you need to know which valve. Lah. Like, it's semi lunar valve, not bicuspid valve, right? Because atrium and ventricle, in between atrium and ventricle is the bicuspid valve. In between left ventricle and the aorta is the semi lunar valve. Okay, so it's ask yourself the which one. So the step by step uh, is ask yourself which one, which pressure higher than which pressure. Okay, then we establish left ventricle higher than aorta. Then we establish that, okay, naturally the high one will flow to the low one. Then you ask yourself, is this what I want? Is this, is this blood pressure correct? If it's not, then we close the valve. If it's yes, like yes, the blood flow is correct, then we open the valve to allow the blood to flow through. Okay, and all this happens at intersection. Next point, uh, last point. Why is it that, okay, it's a common mistake that people will think that ventricle, pre ventricle cystole stops here because it starts going down here. Um, but no, it only stops at, it lasts through this until the semi-lunar valve closes. Why is it that it doesn't, why is it that it's not stopped here? Because if it stops here, then the semi-lunar valve closes here, which means that this period will have a backflow of blood. And it cannot. It will only be able to start relaxing when the semi-lunar valve closes and make sure that no backflow of blood will happen from the aorta back to the left ventricle. Then the left ventricle can relax. So um, this is one thing that I want you to remember that ventricular cyclo lasts until semilunar valve close. Okay? So that is the main thing about cardiac cycle. Really straightforward, right? Like, as long as just use that method to ask yourself a few questions and you know when the valve open and when the valve close. Alright? Um, that is mainly it for... Um, I don't have time to do this. Definitely don't have time. I'm sorry. So, um, just, I will send the answer out. I'll send the answer out. You can go and attempt. I'll send the answer out at the end. I don't have time. Um, but I'm pretty sure I have a lot of questions for this. I'm guessing. So, let me just quickly look through this. Um... So I went through the cardiac cycle. Um, what is, is it accurate to say that vein is, okay, I should, <laughs> I should show you all that question. Um, okay, uh, is it accurate to say vein is less elastic though because vein don't have elastic tissue at all? Um, it still has a little bit, it does have, um, you could say that, to say that it's not elastic is probably not correct as well. Yeah. I think anything just compared to artery. Don't say an absolute. Like, oh, vein is not. Like, just say it's compared to artery. Venue, um, it is artery, arterial, capillaries, venue, vein. So, it is between the capillaries and vein. We don't really use that a lot, but it is, think of it as a smaller vein. No IP bio in over my, okay, no, not, not, not my, are the arterioles and arteries pressure the same? No. Just now we did the question. This is arterioles. The blood pressure already starts going down because the, uh, it's, it's further away from the heart. That's one thing. And the size of arterioles is also a lot smaller than arteries. Yeah, so it's not. Um, someone is sending, I'm sure it's, a lot of students are very helpful and helping me to send the link on the chat. So you should get it already. Why is there a second pressure, second increase in pressure in the left atrium after the pressure increase? Are you talking about this part? Mm. This part? Small part? I don't know. <laughs> there are a lot of like small, small increase here and there, but I don't know why it increases, this slight increase. If you use the two rules, volume of blood, there's no... Potentially the pulmonary, potentially the pulmonary uh, vein is transporting blood back to the left atrium. 
potentially. And the contraction is definitely not contraction, it's relaxing. So I think the only pos possible um, explanation is that their blood being transported back into the left atrium. That's why a small increase. Yeah. But that's me using the uh, rule that what determines the blood pressure. Why is the pressure of blood increases when the volume of this one you're talking about volume increase pressure decrease? You're talking about the lung, right? Because that is the lung, but the pressure here is different. The air pressure versus the blood pressure is different idea. So, um, I think when you think of volume increase pressure decrease, it could potentially be your lung pressure that you're thinking of. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's a fixed time for cysto and diasto. No. There's no fixed time for cysto and diasto. It depends. Because think of it, your heart rate goes up and down, right? Like sometimes when you're sleeping, your heart rate is less. So now I ask you to go run 2.4, your heart rate is going to go up. So your cysto and diasto time will change according to that. There's no fixed time. Um, but that being said, I do tell my students that when you are doing heart rate question, right? If they ask you what is the heart rate, if your heart rate is like very, okay, what is the normal heart rate? The normal heart rate is maybe, if you are a very good athlete, maybe your heart rate is 50, but the very, very average heart rate is about 70 to 80, 90, like that. Like your resting heart rate. So if let's say the question asks you to calculate heart rate and your heart rate is 100 plus, there's a good chance that your calculation is wrong. But that being said, I think it really depends on the question. So I there's no fixed time for uh, cyto and diasto, but, but uh, when you are doing heart rate question, just make sure like the heart rate number makes sense. Uh. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks for all your questions. Uh, if I miss out any, I will try to look at them again later. Okay, let's move on first. Um, because we still need to do like SMT, we still need to do Kahoot and everything. So let's move on to the lung. Um, okay, for lung, actually there's nothing much I want to talk about lung, but it's important. It's an important. It's an important organ. Uh, it it interacts heavily with your transport in human chapter, so you do need to know, uh, transport in human um this part very well. Okay, um, so you can see here, right? This is the blood capillaries. Uh, you can see the blue and red. They are the blood. Uh, they are the blood capillaries here. Uh, co covering the alveoli. That is the extensive network of blood capillaries that we're talking about, right? A lot of blood capillaries surrounding the alveoli. Like, that makes sure that our exchange of gases are fast. So lung is the site of gaseous exchange, specifically the alveoli. Like. And you know that oxygen diffuses from the alveolar air into the blood capillaries, and then carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood capillaries to the alveoli. Like. So if you look at this part, that is the direction that they're trying to, uh, trying to uh, draw. And this is K. So in, in an attempt to link to previous chapter, here is your pulmonary artery. And then of course, pulmonary artery, it goes to an arterial and then enter the lung capillaries, right? But this is the pulmonary artery because it transports deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lung. And then here, after it gets oxygenated, this is your pulmonary vein. because it transports oxygenated blood back to the heart, back to the left atrium. Okay, so that is uh, to link back to your previous chapter. And then how is exactly oxygen being transported? Is, oxy, is the hemoglobin found in your red blood cell? And when they combine, they form oxyhemoglobin. And then the oxyhemoglobin is a reversible reaction, which means that... Um, after oxygen combined with oxyhemoglobin, it will um, oxygen combined with hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. It's reversible. It will it can release oxygen again to oxygen poor tissue. Right, that is how um, when we when the blood passes through like kidney, liver, and then when the veins come back to the heart, it's deoxygenated because the oxygen is being released at the tissue cell released to the tissue cell. So that is the uh, absorption of oxygen. And another gas, of course, is carbon dioxide. 
um, I would say the removal of carbon dioxide part is a lot more complicated. I think when I was a student, I find this part like just harder to uh, remember, but need to memorize. Yeah. Um, but once memorized, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. So um, carbon dioxide is produced by tissue cell, right? We need to remove that. All our cells that carry out aerobic respiration, they will produce a lot of carbon dioxide. And it will be transported as a waste material into the red blood cell, into the blood capillaries at any capillaries, liver, muscle, um, kidney, everything. So carbon dioxide will diffuse into the blood plasma and then enter the red blood cell. Right? This is what happens. This is the cells and then it diffuses over. It diffuses across. That is the exchange of material that we are talking about in capillaries. And then in red blood cell, there's this thing called carbonic anhydrase. It's an enzyme. Okay, it ends with ASE. Um, that is your actually that's your hint that whether or not it's an enzyme. And it catalyzes the reaction where carbon dioxide reacts with water and it gives carbonic acid. Um, and then this carbonic acid will dissociate into hydrogen carbonate ion. Um, I write here before someone like call me out. Like, oh, do I need to know the reaction? Like, this chemical reaction, don't need. I just find it a lot easier to understand and remember looking at this. Um, like, CO2 plus H2O, then you become carbonic acid, and then carbonic acid dissociate. That's basically what you need to know. Um, but you need to write in word form when you're answering question. Okay? And then, after that, this hydrogen carbonate ion will diffuse our red blood cell into the plasma. And carbon dioxide is mainly transported in the blood plasma as that ion, okay, as hydrogen carbonate ion. Um, and then the reverse will happen when the blood is being transported to the lung because this is it's not the hydrogen carbonate ion that is being released out to the alveolar air, right? We are not breathing out hydrogen carbonate ion. We are breathing out carbon dioxide. So the reverse needs to happen. Um, Usually when the question asks this kind of thing, after you write this part like well, then uh, if you write these other parts well, then you don't need to, then you, the, the behind part, uh, you don't have to be so like specific anymore. You can see that my fifth point is very short. It's just me trying to wrap up my answer. Hydrogen carbonate ion diffuse back into red blood cell, combined to form carbonic acid, then into water and carbon dioxide. It's just me trying to like get back the reverse reaction to get back to carbon dioxide. And then the carbon dioxide will diffuse out of the blood into alveolar space and then breathed out, um, expelled out. So, um, yeah, that is the process. I think this is also something that oxygen is simpler, but carbon dioxide, maybe there's a lot more steps. So make sure you memorize this well, okay? Okay, this part. This is like probably like their favorite part to test. Um, so I want to spend some time um, to talk about this. Okay, this is a sample question, but I actually don't really uh, don't really uh, have, uh, have time to talk about a sample question, but I'm going to give you like everything that you need for an answer most of the time about exercising. So you most of the time, so you can see that this graph shows the increase and then plateau off, correct? So basically it cut off at here lah. It doesn't show the behind part, but that's fine because you just need to know the this three part. So there's three parts that you experience. So let's just use an example of you running 2.4 because everyone here experienced that. Okay, start of exercise. So imagine you start running your first round of 2.4. First round, always easy, right? Right. First round, always feel easy, correct? Uh, but slowly, slowly, you will feel that your breathing rate increases uh, or your heart rate also increases because you need to take in more oxygen and at the same time, you also remove CO2 faster. Why do you need to take in more oxygen? Because you need to carry out aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration to release more energy, right? Even if you are very fit, running 2.4 also needs some, it also needs extra energy. So you will need that extra energy. Breathing rate increases to take in more oxygen to remove CO2. And the heart rate increases to pump blood faster to the muscle to supply oxygen and glucose. Okay, so breathing rate is about how much 
oxygen you are getting and how much CO2 you are getting out. Heart rate is pumping blood to the muscle. So I guess if you are taller, then your heart needs to pump harder and faster because there's a lot more surface area to flow, uh, the blood to flow to make sure it's applied to every part of the oxygen and glucose. Okay, so this is the start of exercise. Um, maybe your first two, depends on how fit you are, first two rounds, that's how you will feel. But slowly, slowly, that's just how, there's a limit to how much the heart rate and breathing rate can increase. There's a limit to that. So that is when anaerobic exercise will, anaerobic respiration will kick in. Um, there's a limit, but we, not, we don't have enough oxygen for aerobic respiration. So muscle cell will carry out anaerobic respiration instead where a small amount of energy is produced, to, is released to meet extra energy demand. So this is this part. The breathing and heart rate increase also, no, it cannot increase. It cannot increase further already. Like that's just how, that's a limit as to how, uh, how fast our heart rate can be and how fast we can breathe. So it kind of plateau off. So, which means that the oxygen intake will also kind of plateau off, right? So, that's why we need to carry out anaerobic respiration. So, you know the anaerobic respiration formula. Anaerobic respiration is glucose break down into lactic acid. So, of course, you have to write lactic acid. Lactic acid is produced. So, that is what happens here. Okay. Uh, okay, this is the part where I need to write. Maybe it's not really something that you will write in your answer itself, but it's something that you should uh, you should understand. When there is a lactic acid, it means that okay, anaerobic respiration equals to lactic acid, right? Not equals, but anaerobic respiration will produce lactic acid. The presence of lactic acid equals to oxygen death. Okay, why? As the name suggests, oxygen depth means that you are like negative on your oxygen intake. That is why anaerobic respiration occurs. Because imagine like this is your energy that you, this is the energy that you need. This is the energy that your oxygen level can give you. Then what happens to this gap? This gap is anaerobic respiration. So this is your oxygen depth as well. So your recovery period will always be a about oxygen depth, the heart rate and breathing rate continues to be fast for some time, you realize that they don't like, let's say this is the end of exercise, right? It's not like immediately after you finish running 2.4, right? Then you can like, oh, okay, done, done with 2.4. You will confirm like pen, like pen there for a while and then like complain with your friends like, oh my God, I'm tired. Uh, this kind of thing, right? It doesn't, con it doesn't immediately fall back to your resting heart rate and breathing rate. It takes a while. Maybe you take like longer. Maybe some people take shorter. But it will take a while to recover. That is because it needs to take time to take in more oxygen to repay the oxygen debt. So remember this thing I tell you, oxygen debt equals to lactic acid. So how to repay the oxygen debt? You need to remove all the lactic acid. And there are two ways to remove lactic acid. Firstly, lactic acid is removed from the muscle and transported to the liver. And then in the liver, Oxygen is used to oxidize the lactic acid to release energy. So lactic, there are some lactic acid, uh, all the lactic acid, some of the lactic acid is being oxidized to release energy. And then um, what is the energy used for? To ultimately convert the remaining lactic acid back into glucose. So once all the lactic acid is removed, either, either they are oxidized to release energy or they are converted back to glucose then the oxygen debt is repaid. So once you repay all your debt, you are clear, then your breathing and resting heart rate should be back to the back to the baseline, which is here. Okay, you can see that this is the resting part. So this is your three parts that you will need. Um, depends on the question. Sometimes the question focus on just part three. Sometimes the question focus on part one and two. So it really depends on the question, but I just want to lay out the whole picture for you. Okay. And also, uh, the relationship between heart rate and breathing rate, which affect, like, you know, if you, ex you we, I mean, we all exercise, we know that heart rate and breathing rate will change based on exercises, right? Okay. Okay, before I move on to the next part, 
Let's see. Ayo, so many questions. Um, Let's go through. Okay, you can send in a question now as well. Why is the blood flow in veins fast? Yeah, blood flow is slow, but the velocity is fast. Velocity refers to like the point, um, like the the rate, the rate, um, the speed of the blood from one point to another like the rate of blood flow in certain directions. So when the veins, when the blood, okay, so just now I was drawing. Let's use here. This is the vein, this is the valve. I guess when they mean by velocity, the blood flow is slow in general to, for the time it reaches, for the time it needs, from let's say renal vein, from the kidney to the heart is slow. But the point that it moves from here to here is fast. Let's say it contract a little bit, then it pushes here, then this valve will quickly close and the blood will stay here. Then it push a bit and the blood will move and then the valve will quickly close. And then it push a bit, then the valve will close. So I guess um, that is why the velocity is a bit uh, is faster, yeah. But if you're talking about general blood flow, it's still correct to say that the blood flow is slow, for sure, because it takes some time for this process to happen because every movement is a bit of contraction and closing of valve. Yeah. Anyway, that's an MCQ question. So if you can you can identify the pressure of blood and the cross section area, then you identify the answer. Then that is like good enough. Yeah. Um, just now I answer already. How long is a cardiac cycle? Just now I also say already. De depends, right? Uh, depends on one cycle. One cycle depends on how fast is your heart rate beating. If you exercise versus resting versus sleeping is different. So these two questions, uh, the answer is depends. But there is a standard. There's a standard one, I guess, like uh, about a range. So your heart rate usually is about. 70 to 90, it really depends. Some people have it a bit slower. So I really cannot don't have a question. So it depends on the graph. If they give you a graph, then you just see from the graph. So these two questions I answer. Athletes have low pulse rate because yeah, so that is the exception. You know, some athletes have like their resting heart rate is like 40 or 50. That's like pretty insane actually. Um, um because their heart muscles are stronger and one pump of blood brings all the blood and they don't have to pump they don't, their heart rate don't have to be so fast i don't know if you guys have fitbit tracker but uh there was an effort by health promotion board hpv they were giving out like fitbit tracker to track your heart rate it is like a very direct um it's a very direct thing for your health if your heart rate is a bit lower um if your heart rate is very high Resting heart rate is high. It's often a bad thing. Yeah. Because if you're not doing anything but your heart rate is high, it, it says about like your heart health and your circulation health. So I remember HPV was giving out Fitbit trackers to track heart rate. Yeah. So those athletes just have exceptionally strong heart muscles. Yeah. Is oxygen needed for anaerobic respiration? No. Think. Look at the equation. It's glucose to lactic acid. That's why anaerobic respiration will sustain, will lead to oxygen death. So it does, uh, it does not need oxygen. Ah, uh, high. Um, are hydrogen carbonate ions also carried in red blood cells, or is it just hydrogen and? There's no. Red blood cells carry carbonic and hydrates, oxygen, oxyhemoglobin and carbon dioxide. The hydrogen and, there's no hydrogen and carbonate ions. It is hydrogen and hydrogen carbonate ion. This is hydrogen carbonate ion. This is hydrogen ion. Um, both will diffuse out of the red blood cell. Yeah, there's no 
I don't know if you mean hydrogen carbonate ions because carbonate ions is totally different thing. Okay, and it don't stay in red blood cell. A small amount of carbon dioxide gas may be in red blood cell, but it's a really really super small amount. Yeah, so you just remember about we just remember that it will diffuse out into the blood plasma. Does carbonic and hydrates also catalyze the dissociation of carbonic acid? No, it catalyzes this part. Enzyme is a specific, enzyme is a specific structure, cannot catalyze any random reaction, right? This one you all learned before. Cannot ask me this kind of question. Um, enzyme is specific shape, only certain substrate can fit into the active site, so it cannot uh, catalyze the next reaction. It only catalyzes this reaction. We explain the graph about lactic acid. I don't have time to re explain the graph in lactic acid. So you can refer to the... Uh, okay, maybe just quickly. Um, this is the part that... aerobic respiration, so the breathing and heart rate increases. This part is... Um, there's a limit as to how much breathing and heart... Your breathing rate and heart rate can increase. It can increase, but at some point, it, it cannot keep increasing. And when exercise ends, the breathing and Harry will take a while to go back to the resting because need to repay oxygen there. They try to read through this one again, and the one, two, three basically correspond to the different part of the graph. If not, wait for Daryl to upload the recording. Can you explain? Yeah. Uh... Pushes. No, it's muscle. When muscle contract. Yeah. So artery. Um when it's the muscle that contract that kind of pushes um I guess elasticity as well because it if it expand it stretch out and recoil it will push the blood in in some way as well so both both okay I think that's mostly all the questions left okay um actually for kidney or like for excretion chapter, it's really straightforward. Oh, I haven't we haven't shared I haven't shared this thing called uh that I really want to share. Have you all seen this document? Maybe set three, you guys haven't seen this document much, but this set document is really helpful. It tells you what you need to know, like the baseline of what you need to know. So you know now, like the set fours are doing. Actually, not just SEC4s. Uh, you guys are having exam in two weeks. And then the SEC4s are having O-level in about one month plus a little bit. I've been asking them to use this document um, to basically find out, sieve out what they don't know. So let's say this is excretion in human, right? Why I say this is a very short chapter? Because the learning outcome is very short. And um, this is, this, this, that's all. That's all you need to know about excretion. Of course, there's this part where it asks you to use the knowledge gained in this section to solve related problems. It's them telling you that, hey, maybe you will pop some ex uh, difficult, not so easy questions in. But the baseline, the your, your baseline of like what you need to know are here. This is a very short one. So as long as you know all this, you are fine for this chapter. Of course, there are some chapters that are really long. means that there are contents a lot more as well. So for yourself, when you're doing revisions, you can also use this. Um, document just go google and search like oh uh all level pure bio syllabus then th this is definitely your number one search okay um yeah so use this to see out like what are the content that you don't know what are the uh if you look at the if you look at this question like let's say this is what i'm going to talk about soon outline the function of nephron with reference to ultra filtration and selective reabsorption in production of urine if you look at this question and you're like, okay, I have no idea what you're talking about, or I don't know how many points I need, how many points there are, or what are the keywords, then definitely you need to revise that part. Okay, so for urine formation, it's ultrafiltration selective reabsorption. So ultrafiltration is the blood flow from, okay, before I move on, right? Um, okay, ultrafiltration is forcing it out. So it forces out from, uh, it forces the small things out high hydrostatic pressure that forces water urea salt and all the small molecule out into Bowman capsule. And what causes this force? 
that forces all the things out into Bowman capsule is that the afferent arterial is wider than the efferent arterial. So that drives the high hydrostatic pressure. So the keywords are just this few keywords. And after it forces, it forces every small thing out, but we cannot lose all of them as urine. That is like too much. Right? We need to start selectively reabsorbing what is useful. So basically you can think of it as like pouring all the waste out and then taking back what is useful actually. So that happens at select that happens by selective reabsorption here. And the selective reabsorption has a lot more points because there are many different parts, right? Like proximal convoluted tubule, what does it absorb? It absorbs mineral salt, all of glucose and amino acid, and some water. Uh, the loop of Henley, only water. And then for distal convoluted tubule, water and salt, water and mineral salt. And then collecting that water is still being absorbed. So here, um, why selective reabsorption is so long is because kind of need to, needed to distinguish which part absorb what kind of things. They are different. But it depends on the mark allocation. If the mark allocation is not so much, you don't have to write so details. But I guess the most important one is proximal convoluted tubule because all of glucose and amino acid, in a healthy case, all of glucose and amino acid will be reabsorbed by the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, yeah, so that is the process where urine is formed. And in this chapter, of course, there's a lot of the other things that affects urine composition, right? It contains urea, metabolic waste, excess water and mineral salt. So if let's say there is a protein-rich diet, then the urea content will go up. If you drink a lot of water or you never drink water, then the water content in the urine will differ. Mineral salt as well. Like maybe you eat something very salty, you have you never eat anything salty. The urine composition will change depends on all these things. Mainly what I listed out. Like pro diet, protein-rich diet, how much water you take in, mainly that. And your blood water potential, which is when which osmoregulation will affect the urine composition, right? Both the volume and your concentration. That's why urine is also a very direct um, way for you to tell are you hydrated enough, right? So like we want the like very, very light urine color. Not exactly transparent, but like light urine color. That's like the healthier. If we see like dark urine color, that's, that means that we need to drink a lot of water. Yeah. Okay, this is the part where I want to link back to transport and human, right? You remember I say that this question, these three chapters are linked together and I do want to bring us back to the flow uh, of circula circulation. So um, we learned that af afferent arterioles transport to, okay, renal artery first. Renal artery, what does renal artery do? Transport blood from the heart to the, uh, transport the blood from the heart to the kidney, right? And then it passes through afferent arterial, which is wider, and then through the glomerulus. The glomerulus is the ball of blood capillaries there. And efferent arterial that is narrower. And then this creates the high hydrostatic blood pressure. So can... I just want to give the full picture. So hydrostatic blood pressure. And then after that, the blood flows into the blood capillaries. And blood capillaries is this part where the reabsorption is happening, right? All the glucose and amino acid selective reabsorption. That's what I want. Never mind. You don't know what I mean. Blood capillaries. Selective reabsorption. So all the water, salt, all the glucose and amino acid reabsorb into the blood capillary, back to our blood. And then goes back to venules and then veins. So transport back to the heart. Okay, so this is... Um, therefore, knowing this blood flow, right? Knowing this blood flow. So let's talk about the composition in renal artery, renal vein, and then the ureter. So... Usually, metabolic waste products are present in vein. Correct? Metabolic waste products are usually present in vein. But in this case, urea will be lower in vein. Makes sense, right? Because the urea is forced out here. Afferent arterial glomerulus, efferent arterial. And it's not being selective reabsorbed. 
is selectively reabsorbed. So renal vein will have a lower urea composition. Okay. Um, I guess same for salt as well, but not a lot. Because these basically these things are found in the ureter as urine. So therefore, it will be higher in renal artery, lower in renal vein. As for glucose and amino acid, it will be about the same. Uh, and then protein, of course, is the same as well. So these are some things to uh, spell out. But especially urea and salt, I guess, because that is what is being um, removed in the ureter, which is R, um, as urine. Okay, so these are something that I want to call out that you can highlight and remind yourself as well. I'm sure something like this you know, but I just wanted to call out. Yeah, I put the explanation here. So uh, you could look through the explanation. Okay. Okay, next one. Circulation system. This is where I actually, why I choose these three chapters because they are all participating in the circulatory system. And I really like, I think this one, this is my favorite chapter, chapter seven. Uh, okay, maybe not my favorite, top three favorite chapter. Um, it is my favorite because it links a lot of chapters together, right? This diagram, I also really like this diagram because it tells you how they are linked together. And they give you the arrow. Blood only flows in one direction, so therefore the blood flow is the same for, it's same throughout. So um, the three organs that we went through is the heart, Okay, the heart is right here, and then also the lung and the kidney, right? So let's say now I, okay, I have three questions here, which I clearly do not have time to talk through everything. But let's start with question one. Describe the process where a molecule of oxygen is transported from the lung to the muscle cell in the heart. This is straightforward, okay? Uh, from the lung to the uh, muscle cell in the heart. So here, you need to know the blood flow very well. So where the question is oxygen, therefore, you need to write down first, where do the oxygen come from in the lung? The oxygen diffuses, it dissolves in the tin film of moisture. I should have typed it out early. Regrets. Oxygen dissolves in the thin form of moisture of alveoli and diffuses into the blood capillaries in the lung, right? And then from there, where does it get transported to? Transported back to the left atrium in the heart and then to the left ventricle and then we'll leave the Aorta, it is to the muscle cell in the heart, which artery transport blood from the heart to the heart. It is coronary artery. Okay, it is coronary artery. And then it reaches the muscle heart. Okay, so okay, this diagram may be not shown here, but the idea is that the flow of blood is one direction. You follow, you, you stare hard at this diagram. If you're not good at this kind of question, stare hard at this diagram, follow the arrow. From the heart, from the lung, pulmonary vein to the left atrium. Oh, I didn't write pulmonary vein. Okay, okay don't be like me. Don't miss out all the blood vessels. Unless they say blood vessels don't need it, but you must, if not, you must write all the blood vessels in. Okay, pulmonary vein. Right, so pulmonary vein, then left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, and then in this case, it's special case because it branched back to the heart via coronary artery. Okay. Okay, so this is the answer. Take a picture quickly. Let me move on to the next question. Okay, next question is, describe how is urea transported to its sites of production to where it's excreted? Uh, we didn't really cover how urea is being produced here. So go and study your nutrition in human also. But it's where liver, it's liver. And then where it's excreted, just now we talked about it, is kidney. Okay. So basically the question is, how is ure urea being transported from the liver to the kidney? Okay. Um, I mean, I can type out myself. I, I promise I can. But I'm going to use this diagram to help you guys. The liver is here. 
the kidneys here. Okay. Follow the di follow the arrow from the liver. It goes back via the hepatic vein to the uh then the vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery to the lung, back to the left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, and then to the kidney via renal artery. If you have this diagram, that is that is, should be pretty easy. You just follow the arrow because the blood only flows in one direction. So from the liver, it can only go one place, which is the heart, back to the heart. It can't go, you cannot suddenly jump to this upper body. Cannot. It only flows, follows the follows the uh, direction of the arrow. Okay, so in this case, I will just put arrow, but of course you write it in words. Lah. Okay, so liver, um, hepatic vein, vena cava, this out everything, every the details. I mean, it depends on mark allocation, but if the mark allocation is long, like large mark allocation, like five, six, four, five, six mark, then just list out everything. I mean, they give you four mark, right? You also need to give them what they, what they pay you. Right, ventricle, pulmonary, artery, lung, pulmonary vein, um, left atrium, left ventricle, so sometimes the question will be like, oh, the blood vessels is not needed. Or the name, you don't need to. Sometimes they will say some, um, like the question will give some some more like requirement. Then it just depends on what the what the question says. Aorta, kidney, renal artery. Okay, then So it reaches the kidney, then it's being excreted. So the question that I'll get for sure is, do I, uh, do I need to write the whole nephron thing, like the whole what we went through here? Uh, don't need. Probably don't need. They won't probably not require that unless they like, because it say to how it's transported to where it's excreted. Unless they ask you to describe how it is being excreted, then that's different. So it need to depends on the question. Uh, depends on the question. Okay. Um. Okay, this question, I'm not going to spell it out, but I'm just going to go through quickly. Uh, insulin is normally injected into the bloodstream, suffering from diabetes. Insulin stimulates liver cell to convert excess glucose to glycogen, thus lowering glucose level. That one, uh, this is a question that is more for sex force uh, hormones. But here, there's, it just tells you there's a, another alternative, which is inhaling insulin into the lung as a spray. So outline how insulin enters the body from the mouth into the bloodstream eventually reaches the liver. So this question, the first I I went through this question with my with my with my with my with my tuition kid, all of them write ingesting, like eating it in, like eating, like basically in consuming insulin orally. But that's not what they say. They say inhale insulin into the lung as a spray. So you spray in like you know asthma, that kind of spray? Yeah, you spray into the mouth. So that kind it wouldn't it wouldn't be in, it wouldn't be eaten orally, right? It's from the mouth, enter the trachea, uh, basically reaches the lung, if you like. You can all the bronchi bronchial in between, and then it diffuses into the lung blood capillaries. Then from here, you should know from the lung capillaries, it will go back to the heart, left latrum, left ventricle, and then aorta to reach the liver, hepatic artery. Okay, so after, I think this part is the, the part that is um, the hardest. But once you establish this from the lung, it goes back. I, I, I lazy to write, but you know, to the heart and then to the liver via hepatic artery. Okay, so there are a lot of questions like that that basically just require you to um know a few things um combine your three chapters piece of information into one question um and this kind of thing as long as you practice enough actually I think it's quite a good four five six marks to get you know those kind of large mark question if you can get them then it's a lot yeah compared to those one mark one mark one uh I think this diagram really helps just follow the arrow to know the flow. I realize that there's 23 messages. Um, 
okay, I'm sorry, I see, I saw that people say I'm going too fast. No choice, I don't have a lot of time. Um, just wait for the recording to come back in time, okay? Um, yes, so that is all about this part. Um, my, okay, if it's too fast, right, my quickest tip is look at this diagram and just follow through it, okay? Um, okay, there is a lot of question as well. I think I have time. I think the code is pretty fast. So let me just go through everything. Must we say that oxygen, how do we calculate heart rate? Good question. How do we calculate heart rate? 60 second divide by, actually should I start typing? And you all can refer back, right? 60 second divide by uh, duration of one cardiac cycle. That's going to take me so long. Wait. I can't do this. Okay, never mind. I, I'll answer the, I, I type out later so that maybe you all can refer back. Okay. Uh, why does insulin go to the track here? Because we, it says here, the question, the question states here, inhale insulin into the lung as a spray, um, not into the digestive system. So they give a context of the question that, I can understand if students don't pick it up, but now I'm reminding you guys, let's say this question come out in exam, you need to pick out this clue, la. like uh, it stays inhaled into the lung. So it goes into the lung instead of going to the stomach and small intestine. Calculate heart rate, 60 seconds divided by the duration of cardiac cycle. cycle. If I refer Referring to the questions that are pathway video, pathway, much details. Of course, not. Please don't include everything. This actually, this question, question, this question, you should ask yourself. You should know what is in your syllabus better than no. I will know. Of course, I will know. So, but you should know, and you should know that that is not everything in the syllabus in these three chapters. Actually, this question is more concerning than. Than anything else. Does ADH act at the proximal convoluted tubule or the collecting duct? Both. It acts at all the kidney tubules. Uh, collecting duct part of the urinary system? Actually, it's not. It's a good question. It's, it's part of the urinary system, but it's not part of nephron. Yeah. Um, but it's okay to write that. Um, it's okay to write that. Yeah. But collecting, you are right. Collecting duct is not part of the nephron. But it's still part of the urinary system, I would say. Mm. Um, any notes, you can go Overmark website. There's free notes on Overmark website for all chapters. If definition question, is it must be word for word. If you have, if you can memorize it word for word, then it's good. But if not, it is. It's still keyword based, even for definition question. So as long as you have the set of keywords, it's still fine. So it's not, it's not exactly word for word, but the keywords part is word for word. Uh, is it to say that when the heart contracts, the valve open and blood flows into the ventricle? Yes, left atrium contract, bicuspid valve open, um, blood will flow into flow into um left ventricle. Yeah. Carbonic and hydrates also catalyze. Yes, correct. Cat Carbonic and hydrates also catalyze the reverse reaction. So just now to answer the question, just now the question was. Does carbonic and hydrate catalyze the reaction of dissociation of high, uh, of carbonic acid? It does not. But it does catalyze eh? H3O2. No, no, sorry. I correct myself. No. Carbonic and hydrate only catalyze this reaction. This reaction. So therefore, this one as well. Because this wouldn't be able to fit into the active site, right? They are specific. Enzymes are highly specific. So if you catalyze this reaction, 
you wouldn't be able to catalyze this reaction involving two things. Okay, so carbon hydrogen does catalyze this. Uh, basically, anything has to do with carbon dioxide and water and carbonic acid. See the duration of diastole and diastole. Oh, the graph tells you what? The graph here tells you exactly when is diastole, when is diastole. And this whole thing, 0 to 600. So therefore, it's 600 milliseconds, which is six zero point six seconds for this graph. It tells you the exact timing here. Can refer to this part of when it's diastole and diastole. Um, then for the total duration of the cardiac cycle is 0 0.6 second here from the start to the end. Yeah. Peristosis present all over arteries. No. Peristosis mainly happens in your elementary canal. And when you all learn about sexual reproduction, you also uh it also presents in Ovida. Yeah. So um not really in arteries, capillaries, and veins. Nope. Um just now I answered this question already. So let me talk. How to tell whether to draw the best fit curve or best fit line when the question just say draw a best fit? If the points are all in one single line, then it is a line. If it has like shape, then it is curve. Okay, what are the what are some what are some common things that we see? Okay, sorry, I'm just gonna use this as to draw. It's either increase or decrease or like that, and then there's a per two. If not, it is like temperature. Okay, I don't draw the axis already. Like that. Right, this is temperature. And this is pH. Something like that. So I think it really depends. Maybe you should read into what is the x-axis and y-axis. Like if it's a temperature, then you will know that. Then like the effect of temperature on rate of enzyme catalyzed reaction, then it will be a curve. If it is a um, increase and then per two off, like what kind of thing will be like that? Like if plants, your plants effect of light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration on rate of photosynthesis. I think cross-referencing to your x and y axis. Uh, what is your x and y axis would help you to identify that. Okay. Uh, is lactic acid good for you? Probably not. It causes fatigue. So no. Um, but at, I guess during exercise, it helps, right? Uh, at least the part where it provides the extra energy, it releases the extra energy, that is, uh, that, is, that, that, is that is helpful. But if we say after the energy is released, the acid acid in our, uh, our body just makes us feel tired and muscle cramp and muscle fatigue. Yeah, so I would say yes for a while, no usually. Yeah. How is lactic acid removed? Uh, please refer to the notes because it's spelled out in the notes. Yeah. Um, is lactic acid and glucose interchangeable? No, they're different. They're different things. Glucose produce lactic acid in anaerobic respiration, so they cannot be the same thing, right? So in anaerobic respiration, glucose is broken down into lactic acid, so they can't be the same thing. Mm. And then lactic acid, when it's re being removed, it converts back to glucose. Yeah. So they are not interchangeable. They are like different things. Water in CO2 plus H2O is in the form of water vapor, right? I don't think so. It cannot be because it's in the red blood cell. And red blood cell cannot form, cannot, red blood cell shouldn't be, shouldn't be accommodating gases. The gas will take up too much space. Yeah, it has to be liquid form. Yeah, it's in red blood cell, so it cannot be in gases form. Our body... If it's in our blood, it wouldn't be in gas form. It would definitely most be in in um liquid form. Yeah, because blood is a solvent. Where is the water from CO2 reacts with from water yeah, from the water you drink off? Your blood got water, then water will move into 
and cell content also contains water, right? During our transport in human, transport in human, transport in, transport of material, what is that chapter exactly called? I can't even say, movement of substances question. The red blood cell, when you put place in the water or place in concentrated sucrose solution, what will happen to the water molecule? The water molecule will move in and out of red blood cell. So cell, the red blood cell itself contains water. So that is where the water comes from. The cell already have it. Why must oxygen dissolve in thin film of moisture before moving into capillaries? Not on capillaries. The thin film of moisture is in the alveolus. Why must it dissolve? Because you don't want gases in your blood. It needs to be in liquid form. Your like blood is a solvent. So in general, um, everything in blood is dissolved in water, right? Like plasma is 90% water. So um, that helps oxygen dissolve first and then it diffuses into the blood capillaries. Then it diffuses into the blood. Yeah, so that is the helpful part. Therefore, that's why we have thin film of moisture on alveoli. Yeah, good question. Are white blood cells able to pass through capillaries? No. White blood cells, protein, or blood cells in general. Um, red blood cell, white blood cell, and protein, they are too large to pass through capillaries or anything that is partially permeable. Yeah, they are, they are big enough. La, so they won't pass through the capillaries. Unless there is, there's like special occasion where there is like special, like transport protein, then they can transport through. If you are talking about just general, like diffusion kind of passing through, they are too large to pass through. Yeah. Unless it is meant to pass through, then they have certain transport protein to transport them through. But that's probably not the context of the question, right? It's just about whether or not it can pass through, but they're too large. Okay, so blood cells, white blood cell, red blood cell protein, these three things are too large to pass through. Why does blood pressure of iota decrease during ventricular size? Too? Here? Mm. Blood pressure, probably because blood is moving into the aorta and then here the blood is also being transported away from the aorta to other parts of the body so the volume of blood decreases or uh, like just go back to our two point pressure of blood determines by contraction and volume of blood so if contraction cannot uh, explain that then it's probably volume of blood that will can explain so in aorta, which is the black line, if the blood starts moving away from the aorta into other arteries, that is probably when the blood pressure will also drop a little bit. Yeah. Good question. Calculate heartbeat. Just now I addressed already, right? Heartbeat is um, 60 seconds divided by duration of um, cardiac cycle. Speed of blood is vein is high. Okay, speed of blood of vein is not high, but the velocity at one point to another point. Okay, just remember that speed of blood, blood flow in veins are not high. Just remember that it's correct to think whatever you all know now is correct. But that question just now is velocity. And it has to be, it has to be, it has to be white because everything else, this is blood pressure, this is the total cross section area. Why is the velocity of the venous and veins a bit higher? Because the point where it moves from one point to another point can be a bit, it's, the total duration it takes is long. So blood flow is long, but from one point to one point, it can be fast. So that probably explains why it increased like that. But in general, just remember that blood flow is low. Don't be confused by this question. The blood flow is low and slow in veins. Okay, so don't need to be too confused about this. Why is this? Bypass speed valve to send lunar valve. Just refer to the graph. Ventricular cysto lasts from close to close. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember this, but you look at this graph. It starts from here. It ends here. So yes, you're right. Ventricular cysto contraction, right? So I don't know if your question is, maybe it's typo. Ventricular cysto lasts from bypass speed valve close 
to send it about, of course. Saiso and Daiso just for artery. I don't get this question. Can we face this question? This is for this is referring to your lung pressure, volume and pressure. We're talking about different things now. This are, now we're talking about blood volume and blood pressure, not air, not volume of the lung capacity and the air pressure. Yeah. Uh, wait for the recording. <laughs> okay, wait for the recording. Those before. Um, okay, okay. Let me just finish the question. Those that need to me to repeat things, right? Then I will save it for the recording, which I will ask Daryl to upload preferably by tomorrow, okay? Later, later. Does it mean that tall people have higher chance of hypertension? Not really, la. it's just that point. It's just that the heart need to beat, the heart need to con need to contract harder. But hypertension is a general high blood pressure, which I don't think it means that tall people have a higher chance. Yeah. Thicker wall equals to greater force exerted, right? Yes. We are correct. The blood is flowing up, so my vein closed. Huh? Diagram of vein you draw. Other way about. As long as the as long as the valve closed, the valve is like that, and then it closed like that. Yeah. State mitral valve. Um, uh, can, but I think most school don't use this. I think. But if a school teach this, I think it's fine. In general, uh, we, most school will use bicuspid valve, I believe. Yeah. If you want to state this valve, it's okay too. Why the blood pressure is Z instead of Y? Blood pressure is Z. Because the blood pressure is the highest in artery, and then keep decreasing when as, as, as it flows away from the heart. Just remember that. Blood pressure is the highest in artery and then decreases as it flows away from the heart. And this is how it flows. Arteries to arterioles, to capillaries, to venules, to veins. <sighs> okay. Um, all right. You know what? I need, to do my, I need to do my due diligence, which is to do a Kahoot quiz with you guys to to give out that free um uh, free um uh, free thing. So let's let's start the Kahoot quiz now. Uh since I feel like a lot of people are leaving ready. Hold on. Okay, so those who stay until now, let's do Kahoot quiz. Ta -da. Okay, everyone join. If you want the, just try it, uh, just join. I think it's quite fun also. It is designed to also test your understanding. There's a mixture of questions. I mainly what we covered today. Yeah. So take it as a quiz, even if you're like, not interested to be competitive. Yeah. Just take it as it is. Uh, we have 100 plus people on the line. So I will just give a while more to for people to join. And yeah, I think it's 10 questions. So it should be quick, pretty fast. Can, can, should I start soon? I want to start soon. So quick, quick. Okay. Can I start? Huh? I said 100. Maybe it got, can reach 100. <gasps> it dropped one. Okay, never mind. Just start. <laughs> okay.
is 69693. That's one you can use this to search for your syllabus document and use it for your revision. Good job, good job. Like it's also like about the speed, so. Yes, it's false, not correct. Nice, nice. Okay, I promise <laughs> what you what it comes. Mm. Which blood vessel has a highest blood pressure? Okay, the blood vessel high blood pressure is determined by where you receive the blood from. So left ventricle has the thickest wall, generate the heart, uh, generate the largest force. Um, therefore the blood pressure is the highest in the left ventricle. So aorta directly receives blood from the left ventricle. So therefore the blood pressure is the highest. Left ventricle is not a blood vessel, so it's not the answer. Yeah, so the answer is aorta. Which most people get it right. Great. Wow, 40 places. That's a lot. Um, it's veins. Just now I actually thought about it. Um, because veins, but veins and arteries, you would think is about the same, but for veins, it um uh, flows slower. So at any given moment, there are more blood flowing through veins. Good job. Someone asked this question just now. A lot of people asked this question just now. So you're kind of like expect, like guessed it. So that's pretty good. Yes, it's. 60 seconds divided by the kayak cycle length. So 60 divided by 0 0.875. And we slowly see like the scoreboard like about the same names. So let's see. Yep, it's carbonic and hydrate mm -hmm. because no nucleus, therefore no chromosomes. Mm. So this question, because the question is about adaptation of an alveolus. Alveolus is a singular tense, so one single alveolus. If it's one single alveolus, there's no increased surface area to volume ratio. It's many, many alveoli that increase surface area to volume ratio. Yeah. Um, tr pretty trick question, but, but commonly asked, commonly make mistakes when asked about adaptation of alveolus. Okay, next. 
Só que... Yep, longer nephrons. Um, nephrons look like this. Having longer nephrons means that more absorption, reabsorption of water throughout the whole proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and collecting tubule. So it is better because more water will be retained in those desert animals. Wow, okay. Two more questions. Um, show the media, it is two. Like, this is honestly not anything bad, but this is the healthiest. It's like rehydrated. Too overly hydrated, this is like well hydrated. Okay. Uh, okay. Before we go on to the next question, right? The one that Rin, right? Can, can you take a picture of you getting onto podium, like you? So that I, I know, then you, then you um, send me on Telegram, so I know that it's you. So that I can pass on your contact to the person to send to the curator note, okay? Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's between you already. It's between five of you already. Uh next question as long as you're getting right. It's everything, uh. <laughs> everything important. Um, this is really just for fun, so um, everything's correct. I, 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 unless you choose space, yeah. Okay, who wins? Take a picture so that I know it's you. Then you can send me. Okay. Uh, and to fancy fast. Everyone stay eating. Um, I am going to stay on, but not to talk about um no, they say my internet connection is not safe. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna stay on, but um to answer the questions, but I wouldn't go through sorry, Dylan, it's just the first person. So very close, very close, 200 points. Okay, I'm just gonna stay on to talk about it. Uh oh, wow, that noisy. Okay. I'm just gonna stay on to talk about all the answer back all your questions. Um, so I can like clear this list. Okay. Um okay, let's talk about this kind. Actually, I wanted to share about exam tips as well. Maybe I'll just follow it through. Um because I think it's something you already know, but I just want to like stress about it. Uh, make sure you read every single word of the question. I know you'll probably think like, wow, this kind of tip damn useless. Not like I don't know. But I think the action is for sure a different one. Like, we'll miss the whole sentence. We'll miss this word. Like, maybe the question is like, which one is not? But then you choose the one is is. Or you miss out the entire whole question. Like, they, uh, they give you the clue about this question. So every single word is really important. And our experience is that especially under stressful time, you will miss out. So make sure, consciously make the decision to read every single word. And then what does the question want? Is it describe, explain, suggest, compare? With reference to graph and figure, this one, what does it mean? When you see this, it means that you must quote data. Okay, quote both the x-axis and y-axis data. Um, and then take note of multiple part questions. Like they ask you to um, state this and then state that. So you must answer both parts. Mark a location. One mark for one set of keywords. There are no half mark. If your school practice half mark, it's fine, but O-level doesn't have that. Okay? 
uh, number of lines and mark are a good indication to write. I would say the number of marks is definitely the better indication because some schools like to spam the number of lines. Um, so marks are the better indication of how much to write. And then if ever, which potentially it will happen, you have no idea what this question is about. Like those application questions, right? Uh, which is very common at sec 3 level. You will struggle with application questions. Even sec 4 struggle with application questions. So that's fine. So I think the key thing is really to identify the concept and then put in the keywords. There must be something you know about this question. If you study all your content, there must be something you know about this question. You can try your best. Yeah. Skip question that you don't know. Secure what you know first. Don't host. Uh, okay, maybe you don't have this yet, but this is more for O-level. There's an either-or question. Maybe your school will give that as well. Actually, some school will provide either-or, then you need to choose. Don't hesitate too long. Just, just start doing. But of course, if you really think that you have an equal chance of getting both right, maybe you do. You spend a little bit of time do a rough planning and see which one got more points. Or if you're equally confident with either, just start doing. Yeah. So don't... This is more like a time management thing. Now, of course, of course, check your answer. Okay. Um, and there is this question about is bio like the first ever question on the on this this question? I, I think this is my first question. Is pure bio crammable within three days before the exam? Um depends on what depends on your ability to cram, I guess. Um I was a very good, I was very good at cramming content last time. But it doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't work in the long run. So since you're all sec trees, right? I think this is a good chance for me to say this. You need to get your sec three content very strong. If not, you will struggle in sec four. Um it's like a delayed gratification thing. Now you struggle a bit with your sec three, then your sec four will be easier. That's very important. So I will say that um I mean no choice are now your exam is in three days, right? You ask this question, probably your exam is in three days. So of course you have to solve the most immediate problem, which is your exam. But after your exam, um, I know it's I know you probably don't have much motivation, but you need to need to concretize this. You need to make sure you understand. Memorize is a very low level thing. Eh? Like cramming is a very low level in the whole pyramid. Because once you memorize, once you, you cramming is not even memorized. Memorize is really internalized. And the next step is that you can remember. So for me, maybe you think like, you teach for seven years already. Of course, you remember everything because I repeat every year, right? So of course, my memory of this content is will be better than yours. But actually, um, but this kind of concept can apply to you also. As long as you repeat this process, understand, memorize, remember, apply, which is like doing question, practice question, and then you continue, then you repeat this cycle, this pyramid again, your memory, you can also internalize the content and do very well in bio. And the process will be painless, right? When you say cramming content, it has a um it has a very negative connotation. And it sounds very painful, right? Like so much things, and then you try to do it in three days. Then every day you just keep staring at the book. Which you don't want to do that. Okay, fine. Set three, you you have like half the chapters, right? But in set four, you still want to cram contents one week before, man. You don't want, right? So you want a very you want a very consistent and repetitive process to make sure everything is like internalized. Like you don't have to refer anymore. You just remember. It's not even memorized, it's remember. So um I think that is the goal. So for sec three, I, I can't tell, I can't say this to sec four anymore. They don't have a lot of time. They don't have a lot of time to go and repeat this process a lot, a lot. They know if they are not good in their bio, they have to resort to some level of cramming. But you are sec three. You guys are sec three. A lot of sec trees are here. Um, I think most of you are sec three. So this I, I think you are the best audience for me to say this, that you want to start early, have a very consistent process of revising a lot of a, a lot of like uh reiterating the content, understand them, memorize them, so that you can remember them, so that the whole process will be painless. Okay. I think that is my answer. Okay, but as far as the answer, as far as the question goes, I think it's possible if you are good, if you have enough time, three days, all three days you can dedicate to bio, really cram it in for that exam. Should be fine as long as you're willing to like work hard in that. Yeah. Um okay. Sec four confirm cannot la. Like I don't have I don't have time time. Don't have. 
um, hydrogen carbonate. How? Okay, this is it. Um, what is the significance of hydrogen carbonate ions in our body? It's to transport carbon dioxide. That's what we went through just now, right? Hydrogen carbonate ions is transport. Is is how carbon dioxide is being transported in our in the blood. Because carbon dioxide cannot exist as a gas in the blood. So therefore, it exists as a form of hydrogen carbonate ion. So let's go and look at the process here. Um, here. Hydrogen carbon dioxide is mainly transported in the blood plasma as hydrogen carbonate ion. That is the point of the existence of hydrogen carbonate ion. Um, blood clotting. Refer to the notes. You go. There's three notes. Uh, there are three notes. There are three notes on all chapters for all subjects. So not just for bio. If you need help in chemistry, physics, and everything, there are also free notes online. So make use of them. Go and download all them. But like they are in PDF form. Um, you can use that to help you. Um. Yes. Yeah. I will send in whatever I went through and the answer. Lah. Not really edited, but just put in an answer. Yeah, I think mainly it's that all these questions I answer really. Um, um, yes. Okay. Thank you everyone for um, uh, joining this session. Last plug. Um, if you decide to work with me for um, tuition if you if you want right um really i think not everyone needs tuition i totally agree with that but if you feel like you need extra help you will benefit from the extra help this is the link and if you are signing up for pure bio it's me as a tutor yep um it will be a physical tuition with online option hybrid yeah yeah that's all um if you have any question uh, about the tuition or about um, a very quick question. If it's a very quick question, you can tell me. I will answer. If it's a, can you explain this whole chapter to me? And I do, I'm afraid I cannot answer. I need to set expectation. So, uh, yeah. If, but if you have a question, really, like, feel free to, feel free to tell me. Okay. Or you can send on the overmark chat. I feel like a lot of students can help as well. Like, you guys have been amazing. Thanks for, like, helping me to send out the link because I think I cannot focus. I cannot multitask. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Sleep well. Eat well. Um, Even during exam time. Bye. Good night.